I'd be more than happy to show you the way where the brand new city does lie. It's not found in religion and it's the safest place to be. Just take my hand and the city will set you free. Just take my hand and the city will set you free. C.S. Lewis wrote about a fork in the roadway of life. You get to a place in life and there is a fork. One veers to the left and one veers to the right. Only one of those leads to the eternal city. Only one of those leads to Jerusalem. Now, according to C.S. Lewis, the way he saw it, if you should take the wrong fork of the road and you discover somewhere that you're on the wrong road, you cannot ever make the wrong road right. You can't pray enough to make it right. You can't fast enough to make it right. You can't work hard enough, smart enough. You cannot deny yourself enough. You cannot possess enough. You cannot get enough money. You cannot make the wrong road to be the right road. And there is only, according to what C.S. Lewis says from the scriptures, there is only one way to get off the wrong road and that is to go back, turn around and go back to the fork of the road where you took the wrong road and from there take the right road that leads to the city of New Jerusalem based in Jerusalem, Israel. Jesus said this to Nicodemus. Maybe this is where C.S. Lewis got it. John the third chapter in the book. He said, Nicodemus, you are the teacher of Israel. But I have come to teach you. Nicodemus said, I know you are a man sent by God from heaven. And Yeshua, Jesus said, Nicodemus, you and your people must be born from the beginning. You have to go back. You have missed the turn. You took the fork of dead religion and you've been trying to make it right ever since then and you, you and your people, your nation, Israel, have miserably failed. So you have to go back to the beginning and be born or start all over. You have to be born again from above from the beginning. And you and your people must come forth again on the right road. There is a fire burning today in the fork of the road. God has struck lightning in the fork of the road and there is a fire burning in the fork of the road. The fork of the road has a name. His name is Matt. And the fork of the road has a location. The location of the fork in the road where the lightning of God has struck from heaven and said you must come back here and you must get on the right road. The coordinates 
are 16. Demand is met. The coordinates are 16, 15 through 18. And the coordinates read this way. But you, Yeshua, said to them, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of David, the Son of the living God. Shimon bar Yochanan, Simon, son of John, or Jonah, Yeshua said to him, How blessed you are! For no human being revealed this to you. No, it was my Father in heaven. I also tell you this, you are Kepha, or you are Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build my rock. Oh, and that's where the light and fire God strikes from heaven, right in the fork of the road. That is where the children of Israel took the wrong turn. That is where the Gentiles in the nations took the wrong turn. Matthew 16 and 18. I tell you this. On this rock, I will build my huaho. On what rock? What had Peter confessed out of his mouth and believed it in his heart? You, Yeshua, son of Jehovah, you are the promised to Israel, son of David, that is to sit on the throne in Israel forever. You are that human descendant of King David, and at the same time, you are the Son of the living God that has come down out of heaven. You are the Messiah of Israel. You are the King of the Jews. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Hey, you didn't get this from a human. You got this from my Father God by the Spirit of Revelation. And I am telling you right now, on your confession of this revelation that I am the Son of David, the Son of God, on this rock, I will build my kawako. And the fire of God is burning in the fork roads. It's not a crossroads. It's a fork in the road. you got to go one way or the other. Life is pushing you from behind. You can't sit there. You got to move. The pressure is behind you. It's pushing you. Did you get pushed into the wrong road? If you did, then Jesus came down out of Galilee with a word for you and a word for me. He said, turn around, repent, and believe over into me, and I will take you back, back up that wrong road to the fork in the road to the right road, and from there you can get, bab your life can get baptized over into my life, and you can be with me as the king of Israel, and you can come under the dome of my kingship into what I call my kingdom, my kingdom, and you can have a part, but you have to come off your religious road, you have to come off your Babylonian road, you have to come off. Your Egyptian road, you have to come off. Your national road, whatever your national road is, and whatever your religious road is, you have to come back to the fork in the road where you took the wrong turn and where you started building the wrong assembly, the wrong group. You started gathering with the wrong people. You started gathering in the wrong places. You started gathering in the wrong nations. You started gathering on the wrong foundation. You started following the wrong spirit. You started following the wrong supernatural sign, the evil supernatural sign. You must change your mind and change your lifestyle and come back to the fork in the road where my nation, 
Israel is established forever, and I am standing up in it, says Yeshua HaMashiach, son of Jehovah, and son of David, the king of Israel. He is standing in the fork of the road, and he is standing on his nation, his reborn nation, Israel. He is living in his reborn, regenerated nation of Israel called the Messianic body in Israel today. He is living in them. He is standing up strong in them. He is one with his Father who is now clothed upon him. And his Father is a consuming fire. And this fire is burning at the fork of the road. It's burning one way in love and it's burning the other way in judgment. And if the judgment fire is burning in you and burning around you and burning on you, you have a safe place. You can come back to the fork of the road where the fire has struck. And you can take the other turn and be in the love fire of, of the resurrected, glorified body of Yeshua HaMashiach. And you can have the fruit of the Spirit. And you can have the blessings of the kingdom. And you can have the peace that passes understanding, and you can have the joy that that is pleasure at His right hand forevermore. And you can love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you can love your neighbor and love your family as you love God with the love of God that He first loved you with. You can love your neighbor first so that He, by the love of God, by receiving the love of God, can love God with all he's got and all he is. But the fire is burning right here in Matthew 16 and 18. On this rock, nowhere else on this rock of this confession, of this revelation, I will build my wacko. Ecclesia, Yeshua, Jehovah. I will be my ecclesia. What does ecclesia mean? Or ecclesia? Ecclesia. It means the whole body of believing Christians scattered throughout the earth. Collectively, all who worship and honor God and Christ in whatever place they may be. Notice especially Matthew 16, 18, where perhaps the evangelist, I'm reading now, from Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, Matthew 16, 18, where perhaps the evangelist employs the ecclesia, although Christ may have said, My kingdom, tain basileon mu, something like that in Greek. And he gives a bunch of scriptures saying why he thinks Yeshua may have said, My kingdom. This scholar, decades ago, understood that ecclesia was inherently, linguistically connected with the kingdom that Jesus had been preaching ever since he came down out of the hills of Galilee, upsetting everybody, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cleanse the lepers. That's what he was doing. And later he commanded his disciples, cleanse the lepers, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and declare to the people that this is the power of the kingdom of God that has come upon you not to destroy you, but to destroy your enemies that are destroying you, to destroy all the works of the devil that has deceived you and is destroying you. Kingdom connected. 
I'm reading to you from Strong's Greek and Hebrew Dictionary. According to that derivation, synagogue, synagogue, is simply an assembly. You know what an assembly is? That's a gathering. That's a bunch of folks. A mass of people gathered together. Ecclesia is a narrower word, also an assembly, a gathering, but including only those specially called together out of a larger multitude for the transaction of business. Ecclesia usually denotes a somewhat more select company than synagogue. A significant use of ecclesia in strict harmony with its derivation was common among the Greeks. It was their common word for the lawful assembly in a free transaction of public affairs, and that would be public Greek kingdom affairs. They were summoned out of, that's what the Greek word means, ek kaleo, out called, called out of. They were summoned out of the whole population, a select portion of it, including neither the populace as a whole, nor strangers, nor yet those who had forfeited their civic rights. Ecclesia. According to the scholars who are honest, linguistically honest, in translating the words, know that linguistically and in the context there is every reason to, to support ecclesia as being a kingdom word. A kingdom assembly, a kingdom gathering, a kingdom group, a kingdom quorum to take care of kingdom business on behalf of others. A kingdom community, a kingdom congregation, a gathering of people around a king under a dome of glory fire that regenerates heavenly fire on the inside of their being, spirit to spirit, for the fire of God to not only sit on their heads, but to burn down into their spirit and to burn out of their spirit, up into their heads, through their heads, through their hearts, through their minds, and burn out of their mouth a burning, fiery sword to deliver God's people and God's creation. On this rock, on this rock, this confession of this revelation that Yeshua HaMashiach is the Son of David, the Son of God, on this rock, I will build my kingdom community my kingdom congregation, my kingdom nation, my kingdom family, my kingdom, 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 my kingdom. Jesus had preached nothing but kingdom from the time he had started. He did not teach or command his disciples anything except kingdom instruction and kingdom deliverance and kingdom preaching and kingdom power. Kingdom based. And he did it. He taught it. He preached it. He demonstrated it as the king of the Jews. And don't you forget it. And don't you let your preachers make you forget it. Don't you let them replace it, displace it, and disgrace you and the kingdom of God by making it anything, by giving it any other title. 
by interjecting anything else into it except a kingdom meaning. That's the fire that's burning in the pork. And it's burning in this generation. It's burning right now in 2012. It's burning in the elections. It's burning in the economy. It's burning in the weather. It's burning from God. It's burning in the families. It's burning in the homes. It's burning in the cities. It's separating, sister. It's separating brother. It's separating neighbor. It's separating at the fork of the road. And if you're on the wrong road, you have to get back and get on the right road. The kingdom road, which leads to the kingdom city of New Jerusalem, on the ground in Israel. That's where Yeshua is coming back to. When the Messianic Jews, who are the heartbeat of Israel, who are reaching out for all Israel to be saved, when enough of them call him back and say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is coming back, and he is coming back to Jerusalem. He is coming back right there in the fork of the road, and he will take you with him when he comes back. He will meet you in the fork of the road or somewhere along the road, on the right road, if you've gotten on the right road, and he will whisk you. He will catch you up. He will snatch you up. And he will take you the rest of the way if you have repented and if you have believed over into him and let him take you back down the wrong road to where the fork of the road is and put you on the right road if you're traveling that road with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He will snatch you up when he comes back and he will take you with him right into the heart of Israel, right into the belly of Beersheba. And he will rock you in the cradle of his love in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. He will rock you to the belly of Beersheba and to the horns of Haifa up in the north. And he will rock you in his love, in his cradle of love. And he will raise you on the many-breasted mother of heaven, the new Jerusalem, that he will bring down with him. And you and you will grow up on, on her milk in Israel, and you will be a part of the household of God, the household of Israel. You will be a part of the family of God, the family of Israel. You will be adopted into the household of God, the house of Israel. Israel. You will be, as a Gentile, you will be grafted into the cultivated olive tree of life coming up in Israel from the tap root of Abraham to the, to the trunk of Isaac, to the branches of Jacob, and to all the limbs that are stretching out over the walls, the prophet said, with the fruit hanging down outside the walls of Jerusalem, for the nations, for all the nations, to eat the fruit of the kingdom of God that is in Israel and to be a part of Israel. The fork fire is burning right around this one word. This is where we took the wrong turn. Let me take a few minutes, five minutes, maybe more, tell you how it happened. You can go and study it free, israelheartbeat.com. It's all written out, 10 years of research, prayer, and study, 20 books. It's all written out, and it's all free. You can get the details. I may not be a scholar, but I'm a student, and I'm earnest, and I'm honest. And you can read it, and you can study it for yourself under under the king's dome, under the spirit, under the power of revelation. Wisdom and revelation. There's the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And when you open the book and you let the spirit teach you, Jesus said, if, if I go away, I'll send the teacher back. And the teacher will reveal all these things to you. And everything that's written in the book is written in there 
to reveal me and to bring you to me that I can deliver you and bless you and make you one with me and my Father. Burn, fire, burn. Burn, fire, burn. Burn, fire, burn. Here's where we took the wrong fork. The wrong turn in the road. There was an emperor of Rome named Constantine. About some 300 years after Yeshua was raised from the dead, people had been slaughtering, martyring the believers most of that 300 years. But they couldn't stamp them out. Neither could Constantine. And he had all, he was like Pharaoh. He had all of these other gods around him. He had the god of Thor and he named a day of the week after Thor. He called it Thursday. He had the sun god. He worshiped the sun god and he named a day of the week after the sun god. He called it Sunday. And that's how we got all the names of the days of the week. We're Constantine's gods. But they were no match for the God of these believers. And Constantine got this supernatural revelation. Not from the good supernatural, from the evil supernatural. Bring in the power of these who call themselves believers in this some guy that they say was raised from the dead who believes that but anyway they've got some kind of power so the devil inspired Constantine and he said go ahead and bring this group in and make their God to merge and mix with all of your other gods and you can siphon the power out of them for your other gods, Constantine, and you can stand up in the middle of the circle with all of these other gods around you and you will be the great high priest, the great Roman high priest over all the earth, his purpose was to extend the Roman Empire over all the earth and rule and have everybody subject to him, serving him or worshiping him. Serving him as the Roman Emperor or worshiping him as the Roman High Priest. And so he called his council together. And he said, now look, y'all got to quit slaughtering these these people, we're going to bring them in and we're going to make their God one with all of these other gods. So he gathered, them all, he gathered them in a circle all around him. And he fused all of these religions together. Now strangely enough, you know who was not allowed in that conference? That Council of Nicaea? The Jews. <laughs> Isn't that strange? No Jews allowed. Gentile believers, yeah. So he cut the Gentile tree off at the roots. And he set the rootless tree at his table at his round table with all his other gods. And he called this hodgepodge, guess what? Christianity. Check it out in the history. Study it for yourself. 
Do not take my word for it. I mean, please don't take my word for it. You can use what I've written. You can use what I'm saying. But go search it out for yourself. You can use what I've said and written as, as a signpost. But get it out of the book by the Holy Most God teacher. But that's what he did. He called it Christianity. That was like 325 A.D. Now you know back then, no books were published. There were no publishing houses. They had no way to duplicate stuff. The common people didn't know anything about what was going on. Zero, zilch. All they knew was what these self-appointed leaders told them was the truth. Now fast forward like a thousand years or twelve hundred years. Gutenberg came along. Does that ring a bell? Print and press. Then here come Bible translators. God is moving. A millennium later to get the Word of God out to you and me, us street people, us farmers, housewives, cooks, and what have you, blue-collar folks that don't wear a white collar turned around, don't wear great priestly robes. God was moving to get us the Word of God. Why? So it could lead us to Yeshua, the King of the Jews and the Savior of mankind, if they would receive it. But the descendants of the Roman Emperor Constantine, who was still in major control of religion, now had a new problem. People were going to read the book, and they were going to be looking for this religion that had dominated everybody for over a thousand years. And you know what? They were going to have a hard time finding this Roman superiority dictatorship, religious dictatorship, in the Word of God. So they had to get together and meet. And they met, and they met, and they figured, and they argued. And this is what they came up with. We have to get these who are translating. We have to find a place, preferably in the New Covenant Scriptures, what we call the New Testament. We have to find a place. And we have to make these translators mistranslate a word somewhere that will get us and our organization and our religious structure superimposed into the Word of God so that we will have a scriptural basis for what we've been doing for a thousand and fifteen hundred years dominating the people and controlling the people through our religious practices. We've got to somehow connect this with the Scripture. And so their scholars studied. Oh, they were smart. They were smart. They, had, they could read the Latin. They could read the Hebrew. They could read the Greek. They had it up here. But all they had down here in their heart was religious manipulation because they had been establishing these constabularies, these, these people manipulating groups all these generations based on head knowledge, not on spirit, not on Holy Spirit, 
fire in their guts from heaven, unregenerate intellectualism, humanism, carnal mind, the Apostle Paul called it, the unregenerate mind that he said under the anointing of the Spirit of God is the in enemy of God. He said the carnal man is enmity with God. It cannot receive the things of God. It's on that wrong road. And until it gets off the right road, gets off the wrong road, by getting back to the fork in the road and taking the kingdom road, they cannot understand the scriptures. Neither can they teach it, preach it, or demonstrate it properly, spiritually, godly. Because their minds cannot receive, their carnal mind cannot receive the word of God. So in all of their scholarly meetings, they found what they thought was the ideal place. And where was it? On this rock I will build mine. Now let's go back to Constantine. Let's go back to his group. Representative of his gods. All around his table. Round table. Christianity is invented, and he gives it the authority, not of God, but of the Roman emperor. Now, we've got to call these meetings something. We've got to call these gatherings we're going to have. They've got to have a name. So they go back in an ancient language and they find a word that has been commonly used in different groups for generations. It was used first of people who made a circle around a tree and worshipped the tree as God, worshipped nature as God, worshipped the creation rather than the creator. And then the word was used later as they began to look at the sun up over the tree. They began to worship the sun because it was a circle like the circle they had made around the tree. And they thought the circle around the tree on earth would somehow connect with the circle of the sun in the sky. And they became so dedicated to this religion and to this God that they even sacrificed babies and humans. And they would all gather around the sacrifice and hold hands. And no doubt they found scriptures that they took out of context about the way of the sacrifice. And I'm sure they must have quoted scriptures as they held hands and watched the babies burn or watched the humans die. One word was used by all of these people. An old word from an old language. And it transliterates. I'm not sure exactly how they said it, but it transliterates in the English K-I-R-K-E. -E. And I would call it Kerke. And it means circle. Just like they circled the tree in worship. Just like they worshiped the circle of the sun. Just like they worshiped the God 
to whom they sacrificed humans. Kirke. And that's what they call the meetings of this invented Christianity. And they said to the translators, Aha! We found the place. When you get to this place in your translation, you will translate this word ecclesia as kirki. Or we will cut your head off. And they weren't joking. The first translators didn't buy it. They escaped and they translated it assembly, gathering. But they kept working at it until they found translators who would translate it Kierke. Now they had a place in the scripture they could say from this time the Kierke was born. And later on when the fire fell in what was called the upper room they could say this is when the fire fell on the Kierke. Not on the kingdom. Not to fuel and empower and build the kingdom of heaven in earth. But now, the fire of God, look, has fallen. And the Kierke is formed. Where from hell did Kierke come from? Came right out of Satan's vocabulary. You know what people have been, people today even are saying? Please don't be one of those saying it. Well, everybody understands what you're talking about. It, it's not really that big a thing. Uh, you know, he's just making a mountain out of a molehill. Do you know why we're in such a hell hole? in our religious groups and meetings and in America and the nations is because, not because God has not revealed truth. Don't fault God. God has revealed truth. And nobody has stood on the truth of God and declared the truth of God so that the people of God could turn around from that Kirti road and get on the kingdom road that leads to New Jerusalem in Israel. But the time has come when God has wow struck in the fork of the road and God has said, you can have the fire of love and you can walk the kingdom road. Stay off the Kirti road. Get off the Kirti road and walk the kingdom road to Zion. God has a, is establishing and revealing the truth in the fork of the road because He loves His people and He loves His creation and He abhors evil and He abhors the powers that, that invented a Kierke road that pulled His people off the kingdom road. All the fire that you find on the Kierke road is strange fire that will get you eternally killed. It will get you slung into hell. It will get you hurled into the lake of fire. Kierke versus kingdom. The fire is burning. 
Don't let anybody tell you words don't mean anything. Will you let me prove it to you? Those of you who have a Jewish heritage, how many of your children have you named Haman? <laughs> Those of you who have a Christian heritage, how many of you have named your children Judas? Oh, I thought you said words didn't mean much. It doesn't make, you know, it doesn't make that much difference. Well, why didn't you name your children Haman or Judas? Or how about this? If it doesn't mean, if it doesn't matter whether you say Kirki or Kingdom, What if you meet somebody with your wife? Whose name certainly, I'm sure, would not be this. But suppose you introduced her and said, This is Beulah, my wife. And he says, Hello, slut. Glad to meet you. Well, he's not arguing about whether she's your wife or not, so why would you get upset? He just used a different word, didn't he? And then every time after that, Oh, once in a while he calls her Beulah. Or he calls her Shulamite. Or he calls her Israel. Or he calls her New Jerusalem. Maybe one time out of a hundred. And all the rest of the time he says, Hello, slut. Or he says, to you as her husband. How's your slut doing today? Adolf Hitler is what parents named their child. Say, so, yeah, we all know that happened last century. No, I'm talking about last year. This came to the front. A couple in America. They were trying to homeschool their children. They had named all of them similar names. But word got out that they had named their son Adolf Hitler. Like Adolf Hitler Smith or Adolf Hitler Jones. Not just Adolf, Adolf Hitler. They said it's our child and we have the right to call him anything we want to call him. But the Child Protective Services of America said, uh-uh, I don't think so. In our books, according to our laws and policies, that is child abuse. And we will give you X number of days to go to court and get your child's name changed or we will take your child away from you and we will give your child a name under which your child can live in peace and harmony in the American culture. Words mean something. 
What would the child named Adolf Hitler likely become? What's he being influenced to become? You think if his parents are calling him Adolf Hitler every day that he wouldn't study about Adolf Hitler and he wouldn't become like Adolf Hitler? If you think not, then you don't know a thing about the demonic powers and the demons. It's not a natural force that would call it. When you, when you use the name... The name carries an impartation. And that impartation influences, shapes, and molds a person's character and personality. We tend to become what we are named and what we call and what we confess. And if you're called slut enough generations, you get slutty. If, you call, if you're called kierky enough generations, you get formulated. You get structured. You get caged. You get on a treadmill in a cage. You get a kierky structure out of Satan's dominion, out of Satan's kingdom, and not out of the kingdom of God that's come down from heaven. And that's why the descendants of the Roman Emperor Constantine made sure that Kierke got in the Bible so that all 118 times after that in the New Covenant, the focus is never on kingdom. Don't kid yourself. The focus is not on kingdom in Kierke gatherings. It's on Kierke structure. And the ones who structured it. And here we've been deceived. We've been had. We've been in the stables of the constabulary. Descendants of the Constantine Roman Emperor. All these generations. And we've been manipulated and, and controlled. Until we have been so brainwashed that we can read in black and white that ecclesia does not mean anything close to Kierke. Scholars, whether born again or not, even Jewish scholars who are not yet believers, will tell you there is no linguistic connection between ecclesia and Kierke. There is a connection between Ecclesia and Kingdom of Heaven, Kingdom of God, community, congregation, gathering, quorum, family. And it brings forth a kingdom structure under the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, the Holy Most God of Heaven. The Kingdom of God has a Kingdom structure. Kierke has a Kierke structure. I don't know how to make it any plainer than that. There is no connection whatsoever with the Kierke word and Ecclesia. No linguistic connection. No cultural connection. No scriptural connection. No Old Testament connection. Zilch. Zero. None. The Word of God was 
raped intentionally, forcefully, violently. And they used this tune of Satan and they stuck it into the Word of God and raped the Word of God. And the children of it have been children of Satan for generations. There are well-intentioned Listen, I understand this. I don't excuse it because God doesn't excuse it. But I I have read just just last year an an article by a man of God, totally committed to God. whose paper appeared in an internationally known and recognized group whose name I will not call. But everybody in the Kansas City area practically would know about it. The article was on the website about Ecclesia. And he cut it right down the line. And many have in the past few years. But here's the ding-dong bell. At the end, he said, now I'm not trying to change the religious structure and terminology and theology. Why not? That's my nice little question. If it's truth, Why not stand on it? Who gives a rib stitch whether anybody else stands on truth or not? Aren't you and God a majority? Didn't God take one man, Moses, and lead millions of people into freedom? Didn't God use one man, Joshua, and lead the same group into the promised land? Didn't God use one man, the Apostle Paul, to write half the new covenant? And send him to us hard-headed Gentiles? Thank you, Papa. Oh, we wouldn't have had a canine's chance. One man with God makes a majority. How many preachers have preached that, but who practices that? Well, I don't want to, I don't want to offend. Then just let them go to hell then, rather than risk offending them. Let them burn to death in their character cages rather than offend them by opening the door and saying, Get out of there! God said, Come out of her, my people! Get off the Kierke Road and get on the Kingdom Road with the fire of God in your belly and burning in your mouth and burning in your hands to cleanse the lepers, heal the sick, raise the dead, Throw the demons out of the house and out of the groups and out of the nation and out of the cities and out of the governments by the fire and the power of God and declare, yes, now the government of God has come in the earth and God is establishing His kingdom government in Israel on Mount Zion in the Messianic believing Jews today who are reaching out to save all of Israel and the beacon light of God will come out of heaven and shine through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and their descendants Israel, King David, son of David and King Yeshua, son of God, son of David, 
shine out through the nations and draw in off the stormy waters and the stormy seas. Draw them in on that beacon light straight in, straight home into Jerusalem. I'd be more than happy to show you the way where the brand new city does lay. It's not found in religion. It's the safest place to be. Take my hand. Listen to my saying. Search it out in the scriptures. Stand on the truth and the city will set you free. And the city will set you free.